Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show. Today, a video I've been meaning to do for absolutely donkeys. I do apologize, it's taken so long. Uh, you guys have been requesting it a hell of a lot, but today, finally, I'm gonna do my five loves and loathes of the Seiko SKX. So let's roll the intro and get into today's video. Welcome back guys. So five things I love and five things I really hate about one of my favorite watches. Uh, now I must point out this video uh, includes the SKX007 which I currently own. This is actually a modded version. I will, uh, I'll put a link to the, to the review of this as well. I also own the 013 which is the mid-size version i think it's 36 if i 36 millimeter if i remember correctly and i have owned the 009 which is the pepsi bezel version so today i'm going to address all of those because well i've i've owned all of them for many many years i know them like the back of my hand so i think it's fair enough that i i you know, it, it applies to all of them. Now, of course, before I get into this video, I've got to do wristwatch check. I almost forgot. I am today wearing the Zin 104, fantastic aviation piece. I actually haven't worn it for a while. I had lent it to a friend. Uh, it arrived back yesterday. There's something nice about when you don't have a watch in rotation or it's been away for a little while, you get it back and then you're just instantly reminded of everything you love about this piece. I might do a five loves and hates about this one as well and although I, I struggle to think of one thing I hate about it as I've said in in several videos it is almost the perfect uh, everyday watch so yeah guys if you want me to do a five loves and loves I will try my hardest so let's crack on or actually I should say let's dive in to use a really bad oh bad pun very bad pun so we'll start with my things I love. The first thing that comes to mind about the SKX, and I've, I've, wrote, I've written down a whole bunch of notes because there's just so much to discuss here. I love the design of the SKX. It is designed to do exactly what it's supposed to do. It's an unabashed professional tool watch. 200 meters water resistance, 6425, ISO certified, it's extremely legible, the loom is outstanding, extremely bright and responsive. The markers are all different shapes so you can easily distinguish them from one another in low light, very easy to read. I love the lack of pretense the watch exudes. It's not about status, it's about getting the job done. It's a true enthusiast's wristwatch. It's tough, it's robust, every little facet of its design, it has a purpose. You know, there's nothing there that doesn't need to be there, with the exception maybe of the Kanagawa Wave, but we'll get into that in just a little while. It's a real diver's watch. Now, as you guys know, I have, I have uh, quite a serious problem with my lungs, so unfortunately I will never get to go diving uh, with a watch again, although I did have the pleasure of diving with an SKX many, many years ago, before I had the channel. Um, so I can I can cross that off the list. The 7S26, it's an automatic of course, is a culmination of, of generations of movements. You know, any watch enthusiast worth their salt will appreciate this movement. And sure, yeah, it's been outdated to some extent by more uh, contemporary entry-level timepieces that, yeah, have the manual wind and the and the hacking and all the rest of it. However, the magic lever uh, system, the, it is a marvel of engineering, considering Seiko make this all in-house as well. It's just phenomenal. For, for the money, absolutely phenomenal. And these newer movements that these days are giving 7S26 a run for their money. And when I'm talking about newer movements, I mean the rivals of the SKX at this price range. So we're talking about the Orient Ray, those kinds of 
newer dive watches. They're not proven yet, they haven't been proven. Only time will tell if they will be able to be as reliable and as robust as Seiko's legendary 7S26. Operates at 21,600 vibrations an hour, so slightly slower, but what that does is it prolongs its life because it's less friction on the moving parts. So these things can go without a service for 10, 15 years. It's not only affordable to buy, it's also very affordable to run. You're not gonna have to worry about it like a lot of automatic watches. Accuracy wise, I get about plus five, which is phenomenal. It isn't without its problems, and we'll address that a little bit later on. Um, however, the 7S26, if there's, if you know, serious horologists, serious watch geeks knows and respects that movement because it really is, um, the quintessential workhorse automatic movement. Yes, very utilitarian, but it's not there to look pretty. It's there to be uh, relied upon. It's one of the most robust automatic movements, if not the most robust automatic movements um, at the entry level. So that was my number one. Let's move on to my second major love of this watch. Without a shadow of a doubt, a true icon. It's an iconic watch. Now I know the word iconic or icon gets thrown and banded about a lot, but it means a great deal. It's a movie star, it's been in All Is Lost and Robert Redford's uh, wrist, but it was an icon even before then. It's respected by divers, by serious divers, by watch enthusiasts. It comes from a long line of, of heritage of dive watches from sake of study all the way back in 1965. You can see that lineage, you can see that DNA. Tiny little characteristics that harken back to the early days, the, the um, what is it, 62 mass and, and the early, early dive watches. Um, so I love that, and, and, and you feel it, you really do feel it. The best part is, is that it's an iconic watch that is affordable, and that kind of goes into my third love of the watch, is its affordability. It's still, to this day, one of the best value entry-level timepieces. To put it in perspective, you know, most fashion watches are what? $150, $200 for a little bit more, you can buy a serious automatic professional diving watch that is an icon. By buying this piece, not only is it a fantastic value proposition and incredible bang per buck, but also it's it's the passport, it's the gateway into being a, a watch enthusiast. You know, I know people that have extremely expensive collections and then sitting in the corner is the SKX holding its own with the big boys, you know, with a, a whole bunch of luxury timepieces costing thousands and thousands of dollars more, it can hold its own. It's, it's equally as respected and that is a very rare thing. And you feel its heritage, you feel the legacy, you feel it. So that's definitely my third major love of this piece. Okay, number four, its style. It has a ton of personality and character from the cushion case, those arrow hands, the uh, Kanagawa Hukusei-esque uh, wave on the back that is a really nice detail. It didn't have to be there, but it's a nice nod to Japanese art and culture. The crown at the four o'clock, not something you typically see, uh, but also it happens to be extremely comfortable. It very much has its own identity. It's not trying to be another Submariner or another Seamaster. It's very much its own thing. Its classic design lends itself to versatility. It looks great on a rubber strap, on a NATO strap, on a bracelet. Very, very versatile. And not only that, its scale and size, uh, well, it wears like a 40, but it is actually a 42. Um, so it pleases a lot of wrists. And if it is too big, you can always go for the mid-size version. So it really is a crowd pleaser on so many levels. I think that's part and parcel of the why it's become such a, an accessible watch. Not only its price, but also the fact that, well, it's almost the only watch you'd ever need. You know, the dive timing bezel is extremely useful and that day-date complication uh, it's just very, very practical and a great, great complication to have for every day. Okay, so that were, which number was that? That was number four. Okay, number five. One of the things I adore and perfectly embodied 
by my modded SKX007 uh, here. The fact you can mod them just takes this watch to a whole new level. The amount of combinations, you can change almost everything about this watch from the bezels to the hands to the crystal, the actual bezel itself, not just the insert, the dials, the chapter rings. It's infinitely moddable. You can make it as outlandish as you want, as crazy as you want, or you know, even minimal. If you want it to look like a bland pan 50 fathoms, you can, or you want it to look like Tudor Heritage Black Bay with the snowflake hands, you can do it. What is the most fun aspect about this is that you can make it as unique and specific to your tastes and preferences, or if you want to uh, homage a watch that you've always desired but you can't really afford, you can personalize it. It's unique to you, you'll never see one again like it, you really get a chance to express yourself in a watch. It's not that expensive, yet yeah, my modded SKX was probably twice as much as a regular SKX, but I've got to say, I was getting a little bit bored with my 009, it's just it's so familiar to me. Um, with this uh, modified 007, I have a watch that I'm not going to see anything like this out in the wild, very rare if, if, uh, if I do, and at the end of the day, it's fun, and that is what it's all about. So let's move on to negatives. Now, one of the major negatives for me is the slow date change. It kind of happens late at night into, I think it doesn't even stop changing until like two or three in the morning or something like that. While it doesn't affect the use of the watch and it's very rare that I actually need to know the date and time at late at night, what annoys me about it is it looks a little bit unrefined. It looks a bit weird. It almost looks like it's broken. Unfortunately, that is the downside of entry level, uh, less refined movements. They're not gonna have that snappy change. You see, for example, in this, uh, I think it's based on the Salita, the, the Zin, or all the ETAs that I've also got the date and day complications on. And while it does have quick set, I must point out it does have quick set, when I do notice it, it gives me a mini heart attack and I'm like, oh, is it broken? And then, and then I just re remember, oh no, it's, it's busy cycling through the, the date change. I do hate that about it. it, it is a minor annoyance, it's, yeah. Um, so that was my first hate. My second hate, yes, the 7S26 is, is infamous for not having hacking or manual wind. The manual wind, I don't mind so much because of the bi-directional winding. It does wind extremely easily. You just get, you do the, the Seiko shuffle like this, and honestly, even just picking it up, it winds. It's, it already starts ticking away. The manual wind is not a major, you know, um, although it is a bit more useful, let's say if you take it off on for the weekend, you wind it up, you don't want to, you know, have to reset the date and time. Yeah, I can see why it's annoying. But for me, the hacking feature, or I should say the lack of, is a big uh, minus. Because, especially with the little military mod here, it will be nice to set it exactly to, to a specific uh, time. Let's move on. My third one. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you will agree, the poor quality control on entry-level Seikos. Now, I've owned, how many SKXs? Um, probably five or six SKXs in my whole watch collecting lifetime, right? And I've only had one that had slight misalignment. You know, it's, it's famous for having misaligned chapter rings and the bezel not lining up. And actually, that's something I should say. People give the, the, the 120 click bezel a bit of flack. Uh, for me, I actually like it. I think it's, I've never had an issue with them, although yet yeah, you do tend to find them misaligned. Unfortunately, with entry level timepieces, quality control is, you're always gonna take a gamble. One way of getting around that is to make sure you buy from a, a trusted, uh, reputable seller. That is why I recommend uh, Long Island watches. I've always bought from them because I know Mark is going to check the watch, make sure everything lines up. Sometimes I've bought from 
overseas from Japan or from faceless uh, retailers on Amazon that I don't know and they don't check the watch it's just, they just send it out I've, I've bought a flight master that I had sent back one time a long time ago now and the loom was misapplied had I ordered it from Mark he would have probably have noticed that and he wouldn't have you know sold it to me it's more to do with the seller because unfortunately with uh, entry-level Seikos it's they they have a um, it's within their tolerances of, of what they sell uh, that's the major downside about buying entry-level timepieces unfortunately so you just have to accept that so that is definitely a ma major hate for me um, so what was that that was number three number four the crystal uh, now it is hard lex the, the the crystal and actually i've got to be honest a lot of people give hard lex a lot of flack i found it to be very tougher than well it is actually a little bit tougher the hardness is uh, i think on the vickers scale it's a little bit harder than acrylic not like anything like sapphire although you can mod it out you can add the sapphire very easily to your skx for some reason it attracts smudges it always looks kind of dirty i find myself wiping the watch constantly uh, to such an extent it, it is a bit, a bit annoying and i don't understand how it gets smudged because i'm not going you know i'm not sitting there with my finger i don't know if it's a problem of just hard legs because i i, I doesn't seem to happen to my flighty the flight master um but it is very noticeable on the skx maybe because it's flat i'm i'm not quite sure but ah uh, you can see it there it looks dirty it's very irritating <laughs> but anyway yeah um so the crystal attracts smudges and fingerprints uh, like a magnet it really does so that was number four number four five major hate actually it's not a major hate i just find it a bit bizarre on the skx 07 and 09 the loom pip on the second hand is on the balance of of the hand rather than on the tip which i find a bit bizarre because surely you want to read if you're reading it at night and you want to know this where the seconds is you, you read it it's in reverse so it's a little bit weird um maybe there's a reason guys if you if you know please do tell i would love to know why that seiko designed that you don't get it on the uh mid-size version the mid-size has an arrow tip with the loom where typically you find it uh, on the second hand on my modded version you don't see it because i've changed out the hands i've customized it so i don't have that anymore i've never understood why they did that it's not really useful i mean why would you have this the 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 balance loomed up it just doesn't make any sense to me guys if you know please do comment i would love to know why seika done did that so yeah those are my five loves and hates i could have talked about this the jubilee bracelet or perhaps the rubber straps but to be honest guys i do love the bracelet it's it's tinniness there's something very endearing and it reminds me of the first time i owned the skx as well just brings it all back so yeah my five hates are probably not what you'd expect but anyway guys i'd love to hear yours please do share five things you love and five things you hate about the skx in the comments below i'd love to hear your feedback thank you very very much for watching please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful and as always i will catch you in the next one Okay, ciao.